planned a more computational talk for you because you know um I thought that's what you'd like. I have three stories and I'm sure I'll only get through two. Uh but first, you know, a little bit of background. So why did I fall in love with single cell data? I used to do cancer genomics and then single cell data came about and I just threw everything and am only willing to do single cell data. And that's because you get a continuum from a single sample. If you take a single sample of bone marrow, you get everything from the hematopoietic uh, stem cell all the way to multiple mature cell types, which really allows you uh, to, to study dynamics. Uh, it's often the first principal component, certainly the first diffusion component of the data. And uh, if you order cells along uh, the sort of continuum, you can actually see genes, regulators, chromatin modifiers, rise and fall during many cell state transitions. And all this is from a single sample. Here on the bottom is uh, the epithelial mesenchymal transition and a lot of really weird and interesting stuff that happens uh, in the transition in between. So the Human Cell Atlas, which you know I'm involved in, really led to ra rapid growth. This is why a lot of Computer scientists have sort of really gotten excited about single cell data because uh, computer scientists, uh, certainly people in machine learning, love a lot of data. And, you know, now we have 50 something million cells available. That's sort of sample size that people can do stuff with. And Human Cell Atlas hopes to get 10 billion cells, which will be really quite a number that will allow you to power some very sophisticated analysis. Um, so what are people doing? Well, most of the data, uh, most of the focus, certainly in CS, is, is data integration, uh, removing batches, and, and, and labeling cells. So how does that usually work? Um, most of the methods are based on some type of AI. Um, previously, lots of autoencoders, which I still think are the most widely used ones, but now, um, you know, more foundational models that throw in uh, some transformers into it. But really, you have an autoencoder like for batch correction and for label transfer. And, you know, anytime you do anything like this, you have to sort of say, what is your training goal and, and how do you do it? So the training goal typically tends to be, you know, you want the cell types to map the same latent space to two cells that have the same cell type label should be close to each other in the latent space. That's sort of like good. And, you know, that's a training score, brownie point, each time you really get these cell pipes uh, close to each other. So variations on the theme and more sophisticated models and, and uh, you know, uh, more, more sophisticated training schemes, but you could really summarize it all based on, on these, you know, two really simple things. Um, so here's an example. One of the first times this was done at large scale for the lung um, atlas. Uh, this was led uh, by Fabian Thais's team. And, uh, you know, you're looking at it and nothing's perfect. So you have a lot of correct, more correct than incorrect. This is really early work. So this is like published a while ago. So we've gotten much better. But still, if you sort of break down uh, this correct, non-correct, the cell types, see that some cell types are, are really good. But then you have all these cell types here that are really not correct. And the problem with machine learning is that, you know, you have rare cell types. You could have five orders of magnitude less of one cell type to another. And if you do standard machine learning and certainly standard sampling, you know, machine learning, you know, it gets a brownie point for each cell. So all the rare cells and how well they perform, uh, they're just gonna like not matter and not influence and not move move the, the needle of, of your score. And actually, you know, one of the things I find as a biologist is most of the most important biology is in the rare cells, the, the stem cells, the rare cells. The, the, the tumor initiating cells and the static initiating cells, the, the cells that are, are gonna be drug resistant in cancer, all these guys are the rare cells, which typical machine learning tends to ignore. And here's another example of why, you know, I have issues with some of these methods. Um, you know, a lot of these approaches uh, does what I call smushing data sets together and it mixes it up. So this is our C-cells algorithm that works at the meta cell level. I don't want to go into the full details of it. It's been published. But the idea is we're looking at a, at a COVID uh, data set, and we actually have for the COVID uh, date from onset. And if you actually look at, this is SCVI, but you know 10 other integrate, this is the best one. You see that the signal, the, the important immune signal of the progression of the behavior of the CD4 T cells in uh, the, 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 the infection really, like, you know, immunologists will say this is the most important biology, they get washed out. In the process of labeling cell types together and going across batches and saying, hey, I want all these T cells together, 
it says, uh, and I don't care what you do with the gene expression. I don't care how you mess up the gene expression. And what we see is many times if you care about genes and if you care about biology beyond the cell type label, they mess up the most important biology that's going on in these cells. They mess up the genes that drive gene trajectories. So you, we really need as a field to go uh, beyond cell type label. And so, you know, those of you who are doing this, and I know that there's a lot of people in Toronto that are doing this, I just sort of wanted to give you some, you know, warning signs of things you can work out. This is good, you're the younger generation, you're the students, now you have been challenged, you can fix this. Um, my approach is I really care about genes. I mean, once upon a time, I'm ancient, I'm old, I'm over the hill. So I started when, you know, who knows what a microarray is? I actually heard it, yeah, so some people. <laughs> So when I started, microarrays are what existed. It's not even bulk RNA-seq, but it's certainly even worse than bulk RNA-seq. So the only thing we had was genes. We obsessed about genes. We clustered genes. We looked at genes. And then, you know, now that we have single-cell RNA-seq, now everyone only labels cells, gives cells individual names. It forgets the fact that the cell is a vector of lots of genes that are doing lots of biology that is very important. So I think as a field, we need to go and look more at gene programs and, and, and actually break the cell down to gene programs. And, and we'll tell you, a little, you know, two stories in this direction, maybe three. And this first story, it's been published, but you know, I still wanna tell you know, how I developed the method. I still think it might be instructive. This is sort of a really great statistician in my lab, uh, Russell Kunis, who's a student in statistics, paired up with um, immuno-oncologist. You know, he's an actual MD with uh, over a decade experience uh, treating actual patients. And you put these two people together uh, to really try and say, okay, uh, how can we actually break a cell down with the gene program? What a cell is doing is doing lots of different tasks and each of them I sort of look at as a label blocks in the thing. Now, you know, a lot of people have been trying to do this sort of different versus of factor analysis and topic modeling and you know, factor analysis. Uh, a lot of it's out there, uh, this whole idea of factors, gene programs, call it what you wish. And the problem is that there's a lot of ways to linearly slice and dice a matrix. So what you want is you want to sort of break the count matrix down and say, there's a bunch of factors. There's a bunch of gene programs. There's a bunch of biological processes that are driving uh, what's going on in the cell that are explaining the data. And I can really... Um... Sorry, if you could hit that. Sorry. Um, and, you know, um, basically I want to break down each cell to what, you know, gene programs it's running, to what degree, this is quantitative, and then each gene program I want to know, well, what are the genes that drive this gene program? So that's what the matrix factorization does. But, you know, one of the reasons I, I sort of developed a, a method here is because I just wasn't happy with anything. And, and if you, you know, and when you're not happy with the method, then you say, okay, why does it break? Uh, factors really tend to be dominated by cell types, so people often do factor analysis per each cell type separately, but then you can't get global signals. They're very different. You know, you get these factors, and what do they mean? And you try and do gene set enrichments and stretch your head and stretch the truth. And often, you know, uh, biological and technical uh, factor analysis, you know, they, they, no machine learning knows how to distinguish between batch and biology. They're not that smart. And so we developed Spectre. And here are some ideas that we thought. Okay, you know, we actually are pretty good at cell type annotation. That's the one thing we know how to do pretty well. Of course, there are people who are working on improving it, but it's certainly better than factor analysis. So let's give the factor analysis the, the cell type and say, okay, this is a given, this is a prior, this is an input, a cell type annotation for each cell. Now, this one avoids having factors that are pretty much sort of messed up, sort of like cell types. And two, it gives you a model. Here's the average behavior of this cell type, including all sorts of like markers that define the cell type and whatnot. And what I want you to do is for each cell type, tell me, um, you know, how, what are the gene programs relative to the average behavior of the cell type that, that's going on here? And we can do this in a very cell type specific way because context matters and cell types matter. The other thing we give it, because I believe in priors, as long as they do, they're not too dominant and as long as you let the data take you away from the priors, uh, we give it, you know, input gene sets. This is biology that we care about. We, we the, the, if, you know, if you have find this set of genes in a factor, this is good. It's biology we know. 
let's let's help you a bit because there's so many ways to slice and dice the metric. Let's sort of guide you towards slicing and dicing it in a way that will be interpretable and biologically meaningful. Now, gene sets can explode and could get really crazy. So we actually represent these gene sets as, as a graph and basically take all the genes in the set and just put an edge between them. And so this sort of allows us to load lots and lots of gene sets without you know, any co complexity factor by the gene sets. And this really allows us to be pretty rapid fast. So we, we scale really quickly and, and Spectra actually runs on, on over a million cells within a, a quick time. Um, the graph structure uh, is is not you know is not hard coded. It's sort of a, an input graph structure, and based on the data, we can add and remove edges, and that's an, probably the most important um, factor in, in factor in spectra or feature FS spectra. So, how do you score? Every, at the end of the day, when you're building a model, the likelihood score that's that's the key, and how you define the likelihood score is 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 basically the secret sauce. So. You want the mat factors to match the data. This is matrix decomposition. You want the decomposed matrix to come back and match the data. But you want uh, basically support for the knowledge graph. Basically, if there's an edge in the graph, the genes uh, that are on two sides of this edge should share pretty similar factors. Those are the two um, sides of the score. Now, as I said, we can remove edges and uh, you know at a certain penalty and add edges at a certain penalty make this graph match uh, the data uh, a lot better. But we actually learn a context specific uh, sort of set of gene sets or factors. The final thing is we don't know everything. And so we can actually tune how much we're gonna sort of ask you to stick to the graph. And you could actually uh, have a reliance, uh, a lambda and say, okay, you know, I wanna find some new factors. Some of my factors are allowed not to be in this sort of have this graph penalty or the way I look at it. And of course it learns everything at once. Once I've sort of explained the way, uh, you know, the known factors in the graph, you could find a lot of novel biology in the residual. Of course, this is not the way it does it because it does it all at once, but it's a way to sort of falsely think about it intuitively. And so how to exactly encode the, this intuition into a likelihood and how to do that right, it took us about a year. And, you know, going a little bit under the hood, this is, you know, hairy, hairy math, you could read it in the, uh, in the supplement. But, you know, basically there's two components, the, the reconstruction, how well do we reconstruct it, and the graph. And just, you know, not to go too much into everything, basically what we have is, is an N and N. And there's a couple of things that we did that were actually important. Uh, in addition to having sort of each cell type be an average baseline and factors that sort of model, you know, away from this baseline per cell type, there's a lot of like just really highly variable genes that if you run standard factor analysis really mess you up and just basically litter all your data. So all these highly variable genes that just become ubiquitous in all the factors and just really mess things up, we can actually sort of downweight them. And that really helps making more interpretable factors. And, you know, why is having cell type specific factors important? Here we have interferon gamma, and you see that the level of interferon gamma response and the level of the input receptor is almost entirely uncorrelated using something like score genes uh, directly on the data. But if you actually use spectra, which is, again, relative to the average of each cell type, then you could see, yeah, the, the, the reason is that macrophages have interferon gamma genes up the wazoo at a baseline, so they dominate it. So because they have all these genes high level at the baseline for all the macrophages, they just dominate the data. But if you do it in a cell type specific way, you get a really nice uh, correlation here. The other thing is, again, the, the, the how to model the graph, and you know, specifically, you know, how you, the weight of removing edges, uh, adding edges, which we actually learn directly from the data, and specifically this beta matrix uh, that really defines, um, you know, which factor it really relies heavily on the graph, which factor could be a novel factor, as well as some factor factor interactions so to allow to biological processes that have some overlap in the factors, even though that's, you know, discouraged by the model. One of the hardest things. When you do computational biology, and you probably all know it, I developed a model. How do I validate it? I mean, certainly in single cell RNA seq, the ground truth is one of the most elusive things you have. So we always sort of scratch our head and try and find the ground truth. 
And the other thing is, of course, building this data set. Most like gene sets are crap. So we actually built our own gene set. This is available. It has a lot of features. This is hand curated, about 400 gene sets that are immuno oncology focused, hand curated with a lot of features uh, that make them work really well uh, in this framework. And our ground truth data set is, you know, PBMCs, you know, that have been hit on the head with hard perturbations where we know their answer. So basically, these are sort of PBMCs with an in vitro hammer on the head perturbation where we know what and where is supposed to change. And look at how well we do. Uh, LPS, the macrophage uh, LPS factor just wipes up into the air. We know it's the LPS factor because it matches our input data set. Likewise, TCR and interferon gamma. But you say, yeah, yeah, this was a really easy example, right? Because, you know, I just gave one really hard perturbation and this is, you know, any method should be able to do it. You know, big deal that, that you've got this sort of really, really easy thing going. But this is XDMAP, which is like, you know, deep learning. Look at how it messes it up. This is Slalom, the most widely used one, uh, factor analysis based on an input prior. So you see that even this super easy example is, is not, you know, that easy for um, other methods. And, you know, our reviewers wanted to try it on a couple other methods and it's not an easy test case. Now let's try and do something interesting. So this is uh, breast cancer response to immunotherapy. So you have uh, breast cancer patients on PD-1 before and after therapy, responders and non-responders. And, and then, you know, you can ask, what are, what are the questions? And there are many questions. I'll give you an example of two. One is to find the tumor reactive T cells. For those of you who don't know too much immunotherapy, you know, immunotherapy tries to activate these T cells. They're, they're T cells that, that are really these active uh, T cells. The problem is that tumor reactive T cells, what you want, the best type of thing, and exhausted T cells that are just, you know, not working and can't work, as much as they're physiologically different, they're, you know, genes actually overlap. It's actually really hard to distinguish between the thing you want and the thing you don't want if you just do, you know, standard approaches. The goal is can spectra deconvolve these, and what does it mean? And macrophages, they're known to be incredibly important in terms of resistance to, 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 to checkpoint therapy. It's very clear to everyone, but it's very murky. This whole thing is poorly understand their, the, you know, who they are, what they are, what's going on with the macrophages is just like a big, you know, wild west. So we ran spectra on this data set. And first let's look at the T cells. And as you can see in score genes, the tumor reactive and the exhausted, you know, gene input gene programs are almost entirely overlapping. They hit the same cells almost no difference whatsoever, you can't distinguish them. But spectra, which remember, can take an input gene set and then adapt the graph, you know, it actually said, okay, here's my tumor reactive factor, and here's my exhaustion factor, and now it found, you know, different sets of genes. And actually the tumor reactive uh, cells overloaded with the cells that are having clonal expansion, which means they're probably, too, you know, clonal expansion is a good proxy to tumor reaction. And you could see that the responders had many more tumor reactive uh, cells both before and even more after therapy uh, relative to the non-responsive cells. This is exactly what you want to find. And again, you say, okay, this is easy peasy, but other methods, and again, I'm just giving you each time two, but six other methods do not distinguish between non-responders and responders in their sort of tumor reactive factor. And we even had another ground truth data set where we knew exactly who the tumor reactive cells were. And look at how this sort of histogram just pops up perfectly on the mono cells. Again, it's ground truth data that just says correct. And again, the other thing is not only to identify the cells, but identify the genes. The input gene set was eight, and now uh, we have uh, 42 new genes. And these new genes actually make a lot of sense. And since we started working on this, and since, you know, and, and, and by the time we actually published it after revision, many of these new genes had been published in that year as, as bona fide um, genes that play a role in, in tumor reactive sets. Okay, macrophages. Clustering fails to really find, um, clustering to, the, to really find, you know, a, a subset, a cluster that you know correlates or corresponds to, to non-responders. 
So these red cells are the ones that are the, the, the cell type that's expanding in non-responders. And you can see that there's not that much correspondence between the red cells and the black cells, which is the cluster that, you know, did the best, uh, had the best score. Um, you know, with spectra, again, you could look at it as a continuum because these factor loadings are continuous variables. They're not like discrete, not yes, no. And, and we could see actually a continuum of these different factors that, that made a lot of sense. Um, but really what we focused on is this one factor to really overlap, you know, really nicely uh, with our expanding um, cells in the non-responsive cells. And this was a novel factor with the low lambda. So this factor didn't match any input gene set. It certainly corresponded very strongly in non-responders. And the very same factor in a sort of independent validation data set also matched non-responders. So this is a, a completely different data set. It's even a slightly different clinical setting, but we still got the same sort of novel macrophage factor, something that strongly correlates with non-response. Now, at, and of course, you know, there's a lot of biology to learn from that, but I'm gonna skip that part. Now, you know, we're talking about Atlas integration. And my big belief in terms of Atlas integration is, you know, one of the problems is we're trying to, you know, integrate everything at the level of single cells uh, and single genes. And what if our new representation for cells are their factor loadings? And so, you know, the factor loading, it, it sort of captures biology. So what we decided to do is we, we ran um, spectra on 318 patients collected from 21 different studies from all over the world with no batch correction whatsoever. We inputted the original data, nothing. Just each, you know, sample, just put it in there into spectra, all together, no batch correction. And, you know, some of the factors actually were factors like batch. This factor is a factor of the frozen cells. Um, and then again, once you can account for the batch of factors, then you can get cleaner biology. And what we found is, you know, almost all the factors we found previously, and this is lung cancer, and it's not even an immunotherapy data set, but we found the tumor reactivity factor with the crazy overlap in terms of the gene. We found the macrophage invasion factor with a crazy overlap, as well as a lot of novel metabolic factors. And now that we have a cohort, then we actually can take factor loadings and match them with clinical covariates and found a lot of sensible things. So, you know, for the entire data, you get which are the actual gene programs that are active in this data set. For each gene program, what are the genes in this context, in this biology, that are relevant to this gene program? And for each cell, quantitatively, how active are the genes in this thing? So, you know, I'll just lay this up here um, just for you guys to sort of uh, use and enjoy, um, and uh, hopefully you'll find it useful. Now, what is the problem with spectra? You know, spectra is linear. Linear is great because it's robustness, it's speed. Uh, you know, we often know that things aren't linear, but linear is so robust that we go, let's go for it. Um, but gene programs can have dependency between them. Like, they're not always linear, this linear uh, thing. And, and one great example is derailment during disease. So that started right now, uh, faculty at Columbia was still a postdoc in my lab. It took us forever to get it right. It's one of these more challenging things. And along the way, two uh, really talented grad students from uh, Elham's lab, Sheila Joy, joined it. And we really wanted to understand AML. And I thought that since you guys in Toronto are such huge uh, experts in AML, I'll tell you a little cute uh, AML story with you know a little bit of methods development along the way. So AML is a... a development derailed, and I said one of my favorite things in, in single cell data is just sort of continuums, the fact that you could get, you know, hematopoiesis from a single cell, and here AML is hematopoiesis gone wrong. And if you look at, at the cohort level, and this is sort of uh, uh, data that we collected, these patients are actually Canadian, they're from Montreal, not from Toronto. Um, each AML is uh, drastically different from one another. You don't want to integrate this. This is not batch because the immune cells perfectly overlap. So doing batch correction on cancer cells is typically wrong because cancers, individual cancers are very unique. And you can sort of get as a sanity check, the immune cells are well mixed. So 
This is not an issue of batch. This is true biological difference between the patients. But, you know, we have this other group of super well-mixed cells, and we measure it by entropy, and we basically see that, you know, the cells don't sort of group by, by, by patient. They just are all well mixed together in the neighborhood of each of these cells. The entropy of what patient came from is really high. So what are these cells? These are all sort of, you know, stem cell-like cells. They all look like sort of, you know, I wouldn't say they're stem cells, but they're like the hemipoietic stem cells. They're sort of really early uh, pre-leukemic states. But the problem is uh, that we only have 106 of them, so that's not really good. And so what we think is going on is, you know, everyone, you know, all our hematopoiesis for normal people, all the people in the room hopefully are healthy, and we all have very similar, you know, canonical hematopoiesis. Pre-leukemic, you know, cells aren't, you know, so deviated. So our pre-leukemic cells are still pretty much alike. And then they each derail in their own individual derailments. And so how can we understand this derailment? So the first thing is, you know, derailment happens in these rare cells. You know, we want to see, you know, this early stage of when it derails, not, you know, this massive mature blast, which long derailed and we don't know what happens there. And uh, so what we did is we found markers that are unique uh, to, to, this, uh, to, to this cell. Uh, in addition to CD34, we also found um, PROM1, which helped us really enrich a lot more. So we went up from 160 cells, which you really can't do much with, to uh, over 37,000 cells uh, across a couple of patients. So now we can really zoom in on this derailment. And we, we looked at it because NPM1 is near the three prime end. We could actually see which are the, these are all NPM1 mutated um, cancers. They actually all have TET2. Um, and many of these gray cells have TET2 and NPM1. And we could see that actually, you know, a lot of these cells, they're, they're actually really, you know, some of them have TET2, but they're very wild type in their behavior. And then we can actually see that little bridge uh, those rare populations uh, of, of progenitor cells that, you know, develop an NPN1 mutation. And so all this important action is happening in these rare cells, and we wouldn't have gotten what I'll show you soon without really enriching for them and sorting. Okay, again, batch correction. I'm going to like bash, bash batch correction. So, you know, UMAP, you know, that doesn't cut it because the ML and the healthy, they just don't overlap and you can't sort of compare them. So, you want to do something to say, well, these cells match these cells. So, you know, you obviously can't say, well, I'm not going to do any batch correction because it's bad. On the other hand, batch correction, and, you know, we, I'm showing you SCVI, but I can tell you all the methods uh, are all equally crappy. They just like, as I said, smoosh the data together with no rhyme or reason, just wiping out all the AML biology while they're at it. Um, so, we wanted to build our own framework for disease der derailment. And, and this is something that one of the longest projects in my lab, which took many twists and turns, but I'm quite happy. So what's the intuition? You know, what was one of the first earliest uh, steps uh, in single cell uh, genomics or single cell anything it was actually done originally with Cytoff. Everyone was doing PCA. All these immune cells got sort of smushed together and we realized that we actually that, that there's a lot of non-linearity so we needed a non-linear approach for dimensionality reduction and so the first step was going from pca to a non-linear tsne which allowed us to really separate the cell types and capture the geometry of this data but there's different degrees of non-linearity we can't say check we've switched non-linearity and we're done so our idea is we want to boost the non-linearity and we're going to have a nested model of two neural networks, one on top of the other. And this will allow a lot of interesting things as I showed. So this is the standard SCVI model, just straight out of the box. Gene expression and sort of um, generative uh, autoencoder neural network that goes from, you know, a bunch of uh, latent variables. Here we have 10, but it'll be 20, 30. And uh, it generates uh, in a linear way, because um, SCVI is linear, uh, uh, all the gene expression in a generative fashion. What we add here is one additional 
neural network, a uh, higher level re representation. So now we have one neural network that goes uh, from two latent variables and generates the sort of higher dimensional 10 latent components. And then a second neural network autoencoder, generative uh, autoencoder that goes, uh, variational autoencoder that goes to the full gene expression. And there's um, also some links from the top level to the bottom level as well, which is sort of critical for the nonlinearity. Uh, that's the amortized inference and it creates dependency between latent components. So again, to explain what I mean, if you look at uh, any SCVI um, sort of latent space, and uh, I'm showing you this for this particular data, but pretty much, I, you know, I, I, I challenge you to find me a latent space that doesn't look for it because SCVI is actually sort of optimized to find these independent latent components. You see that, you know, there's a bunch of blobs and, you know, all the latent components of SCVI are just basically independent of one another, but biology components has dependencies. And if you see the decipher components, the, the middle layer now, because we now have a sort of nested model, you could see all these beautiful dependence in the sort of late, uh, uh, cell type specific and uh, factor specific manner. So we actually can get dependencies between the latent components themselves. And these dependencies allow us to find both shared and independent features of, of the uh, derailment. So we can find factors that are shared between disease and normal, and we can find factors that are unique to either disease and normal. And this is what these dependencies allow us, a combination of both shared and distinct components. Another great advantage of having a, a, a deep, deep, a deeper latent layer that's only two dimensions is you have a latent of two dimensions. There's no, let's take the latent space and do you know, whatever you map on it and destroy the geometry of the latent space. We are directly plotting the two dimensions of the latent space right here. And lo and behold, the first uh, latent variable is maturation. If you sort of look at the genes, if you look at the annotations going from left to right, you actually see both in the AML early blasts, late blasts, and in uh, the, the healthy uh, component, early cells and, and fully mature cells. The Y component is disease derailment. Now I'm showing you one example, but like we've run this on uh, now 20 different AMLs. We've run this on sort of colon cancer and a bunch of other cancers. It's pretty consistently, you know, coming up as the two strongest components in sort of developmental disease cancery things where one is the disease and the other is sort of like the, the major axis of, of development. See how it organizes nicely in the cell type along you know, the order that you expect. And again, you, know, you actually see the sort of NPM1 uh, mutation starting to rise exactly you know, during the disease derailment. Um, so, you know, I can wave my hands and say, look, this is great, and I got it perfectly, and I'm awesome, but we wanted to try and quantify this. And again, building the ground truth was very high, hard, so we decided to build a score that's sort of really based on um, uh, sort of logic. So what do we want? What is a good organization? What is success in terms of like our scoring metric? We want the cells to be ordered to their maturity, whether they're in the healthy or in the AML, you know, we want the ordering of you know earlier cells to become before uh, later cells and to sort of the latent to sort of organize the ordering according to the known biological order. And we want the derailment, like if we have very early AML cells close to, to you know very early hematopoietic cells, that's okay. But if we have late full-blown AML blasts that are mapping to normal hematopoietic cells, that's bad. So we developed a score that does exactly that. And we benchmarked it, you know, across, now this is an example of three AMLs across all sorts of other approaches. We see that both in terms of order, like some methods do well in one, but not the other. You can either get the ordering or you could get the derailment, but often, you know, you have a very strong trade-off and the cipher has a good trade-off of being able to get both the ordering and the divergence. And that's ex exactly because it could have dependent factors. The other really great thing, and I, really hate it when people sort of 
say UMAP1 and UMAP2 axes, because they're not real axes. You cannot take a point in UMAP space and actually give it a value because it's sort of some optimization factor. There's no meaning to UMAP1 and UMAP2. But because the cipher is a generative model, I can take any point along this trajectory, this point even, even if points that I don't have any cell or that I have a rarity of cells, any point in my, this is a generative model, so I can take any point in my space and run it through the decoder and create gene expression trends. So now I can say, okay, if this is the way the gene expression uh, trajectory looks in healthy. This is the way the gene expression looks in perturbed. I get it directly from my model. It's the noise that picks up, you know, what I think is going on in sort of rare sparser regions. And it basically generates gene trends for both the, 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 the AML and the healthy uh, for each gene uh, along sort of this trajectory. So again, going back to bashing SCVI, and it's not an SCVI specific thing. Um, you, you take any one of these sort of batch correction methods and you get the same degree. You know, here, oh, suddenly, you know, CD, you know, you, you get opposite trends, you get behaviors that don't exist. As I said, the data integration really messes it up on, on, on the gene level. And, you know, these are really important genes for, for AML. But the decipher reconstructed trends does it right. And again, I bring you two genes, but these aren't cherry picked, but, you know, choose your favorite gene and, you know, they'll almost all be correct. And so now we can actually look at these peaks and say, where, where does each gene peak? And you see that normal peaks, um, um, you know, in a coordinated fashion. And this coordination is completely um, disrupted in hematopoiesis. To really understand shape beyond just a single peak, uh, we built a generative model that actually, you know, decomposes uh, each trend into a bunch of canonical patterns, a, a basis decomposition of patterns, so that now we can quantify and compare gene trends, basically giving a shared gene, uh, shared, a shared basis for all the genes and all for the disease and normal, allowing us to have this sort of uh, weight functions to allow to do a comparison. This allows us to find the cascade of the most disrupted genes. So these are the most disrupted TFs in AML1 and the cascade of where they peak. You could see how this relates to exactly where the NPM1 mutation has. So after the NPM1 mutation, we have this cascade of derailed um, uh, 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 transcription factors, and actually we find in this sort of cascade a lot of the motifs of earlier transcription factors appearing uh, in the ATAC sort of open regions of later transcription factors. So you're actually creating a cascade of one derailed transcription factor derailing another along this cascade. And what's really nice is, you know, we ran this analysis separately and independently on multiple AMLs. And uh, you know, we see um, that GATA1 and KLF is already disrupted by TET2. Uh, we see coordinated Hawks family disrupted by an, oh, I forgot. So I was saying 15 out of these 20 most disrupted TFs were independently found in three separate patients, three separate data sets. So this is something canonical and found independently. And we could actually now say, when different things are disrupted relative to TET mutation, uh, relative to NPM1 mutation. And so again, this is, uh, you know, an extra layer of nonlinearity allows us to capture derailment, allows us to capture factors um, that are dependent, allows us to really break down gene trends into sort of uh, comparable factors and a direct 2D vi visualization. Now, I said I'll never get to the third. I'm always like included just to see if things go really fast. Uh, MSK is a great place. It's in New York City. It's a fun city. And I have two types of jobs. I always have uh, postdoc positions available. But also, we have a single cell innovation lab. And the single cell innovation lab uh, actually has staff positions uh, that are more stable, less stressful, and better salary for computational and experimental uh, biology. But, you know, you don't get to do this, you know, cutting edge, most innovative project, but it does have a service component. So there is a trade-off here. And uh, finally, you know, um, Russell and Thomas, um, 
developed Spectra with a bunch of other great people in the lab. Elham, uh, together with Vincent in my lab, did the first steps of uh, Decipher and then uh, Shield and Joy really pushed it. And this is us and another great thing that you have in New York City, uh, Drunken Shakespeare, uh, which if you're ever in New York City, I highly recommend uh, taking an evening in dr Drunken Shakespeare, especially if you're, they have to be over 21 year old grad students and uh, it's a blast. So thank you very much.